Let's talk about late medieval armor and deep penetration. Hey folks, Matt Easton here, Scholar Gladiatorian. Now, uh, this isn't gonna be by any means a comprehensive video. In fact, I'm gonna keep it pretty short. Um, but the subject of armor penetration seems to be ever popular, especially when we're talking about longbows and crossbows and things like that. But additionally, looking at armor penetration with hand weapons as well, such as swords and pole axes and things like that. Now, people often seem to fixate when they're doing tests on penetrating things like helmets or breastplates or that kind of stuff. Now, it has to be said right off the bat that there is a huge variety in armor within a suit of armor and within armors between different people in terms of the steel quality, the whether it's steel or iron uh, and the iron quality, um, if it's heat treated, and the thickness, okay? Um, so we've essentially got the material is different and the thickness is different. Even if we take a late 15th century knight uh, wearing the absolute top quality armor from uh, Germany or Italy that's been heat treated, made of steel, this kind of stuff, even within that harness, number one, you've got varying thicknesses. So for example, comparing a helmet or a breastplate to a greave or a van brace, completely different thicknesses, drastically different. You might have the front of a helmet that's something, or the front of a breastplate that's something like as thick as three millimeters, and you might have a greave which is like 0.8 of a millimeter, hugely different thicknesses. Um, but in addition to that, so even within the top level armor, they're covered in different thicknesses. There are gaps, okay? Now those gaps can be filled by various things. They can be filled at the best, by mail, aka chain mail, okay? So mail can be very resistant to all sorts of cuts and thrusts, um, and mail itself varies hugely in quality, ring size, ring thickness, rivet type, blah, 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 okay? So huge variations in the mail, and that's a best case scenario. In a worst case scenario, a gap between these plates might be, for example, at the back of the leg, might simply be fabric, might be nothing but a gap, okay? Straight between into one layer of fabric in some uh, hose, for example, linen or woolen hose, straight into the leg, into the thigh, into an artery, boom, dead, okay? So that's the worst case scenario. And then you've got everything in between that. There might be layers of fabric, there might be, um, certain types of wrappings that you certain sometimes get mentioned uh, being uh, at the back of knees. Or if we're talking about armpits or inner um, elbow, there might be male as mentioned, but there might simply be fabric or there might be an arming doublet and arming doublets themselves vary. So huge levels of variation. That being said, okay, so all of those uh, things aside, people are still massively interested in how did people wearing armor of the day and of course other soldiers might not have they might only have a helmet and a padded jack and that was it but how did armors uh, armor of the day the best armor of the day stand up to weapons of the day well um i was actually looking at a book here which i'm going to link below which is by um bob as i know him on here robert woosnam savage uh, bob savage as i know him um and i've uh, worked with bob a couple of times on a couple of different projects one on a tv thing and also recently i was up at the royal armories um, from where he's retiring. He may have actually retired by now. I think he probably has uh, quite recently, very recently. And he was up there working at the Royal Armouries uh, for many, many years. And um, I was lucky enough to um, spend part of a day with him um, and have breakfast and chats and stuff like this. But anyway, this book linked below is small, but really good. And I really recommend if you're interested in uh, late medieval arms and armor, this is a book you want to have on your bookshelf amongst the other books uh, on that subject. And it's really good. And it's got some little nuggets and bits and p bits of information in here, which I haven't seen in other sources. So I'm going to recount a couple of these which relate to armor penetration, which might be of interest, but I highly recommend you get this book and the links below. So the first source is actually talking about the effectiveness of swords um, in the, this is actually set in 1397, but this is a source from 1449. Either way, and whether this is a true account, an accurate account of the historical event, the fact is it's being written down in around 1449. So it is a contemporary description of what they see as plausible combat. Um, and so it basically it describes outside the walls of uh, Ponte Vedra in 1397, Don Pero Nino uh, fought a foot soldier. And it describes in the source, it says, at length they came to grips one with the other and gave each other sword blows upon the head. Pero Nino struck Gomez so hard above the shield that he split it for a hand's breadth the shield that is, and his head 
down to the eyes. Um, and that was the end of Gomez Domeo. Now, we don't know what Gomez was wearing on his head. Um, it suggests, if it's cut all the way down to here, that probably not a helmet. Maybe the helmet had fallen off or come off. We don't really know. Uh, but anyway, it then goes on um, to say that in the aftermath, Nino found that, and I just quote the source here, it's from... Um, Gutierre Diaz Gámez um, from El Vitorial. <laughs> I'm really bad at uh, Spanish pronunciation, I'm saying. The Cronica de Don Peronino, so the Chronicle of Don Peronino, mm. dated to about 1449. And it says that in the aftermath, Nino discovered that his good shield was tattered and all in pieces. His sword had, it, had its gilded hilt almost broken and wrenched away, and the, which presumably means falling off. And the blade was toothed like a saw and dyed with blood. Now that's a very interesting detail because oftentimes people try to describe um, medieval sword combat as not resulting in as mashed up edges as later types of, you know, saber fencing does. But here we've explicitly got a medieval 15th century description of a sword blade being notched like a saw uh, from contact with other weapons, obviously. And it could be from armour as well, actually, armour edges. And his armour was broken in several places by lance heads, of which some had entered the flesh and drawn blood. Now, this is one of the, this is the crux. The reason I've read this one is because it's the crux of the problem when we're talking about armour being compromised in the medieval period. With these sorts of written descriptions, we don't know precisely which pieces of armour and how they were compromised. And also notice that it says the armour was broken in several places by lance heads, of which some had entered the flesh and drawn blood. Well, drawn blood, it could just be a scratch. If you watch the video where um, Todd and I tested his hilted poleaxe, and I hit the brigandine as hard as I could, I actually, with half sorting, put the point through the brigandine twice, um, with not too much effort. Now it didn't go deep enough in to incapacitate someone, but it went far enough in to draw blood, potentially, certainly if they were just wearing an arming doublet underneath. So that could describe this. So it could be going straight through a plate, okay, and it's a lance head. It doesn't say used from horseback, but probably. Um, so I can see a lance going through thinner plates, like brigandine plates, or van brace, or um, greave, or uh, quiz thigh armour, stuff like this. So indeed, it could go straight through a plate. But here's the elephant in the room. We don't know if they're describing plate in this. It could be the male in the voiders, in the gaps between the plates. We don't really know. So it could be a lance head going through male, or it could be through plate. It could be a thicker plate or a thinner plate, we don't know. And this is one of the problems with medieval sources. Now here's another source that Bob gives in reference to the Battle of St Albans 14, 1455 during the Wars of the Roses. And it describes, and this is from the Paston letters incidentally, which are contemporary, they were written during the Wars of the Roses. And it says that Henry Philongly, I think the name is pronounced, or Philongly maybe, uh, was shot through the arms in three or four places. Now again, <laughs> By arrows, that is, by longbow arrows. Um, now, again, that could mean through plate. It could mean through thinner plates. And bear in mind that an English man-at-arms at the Battle of St Albans, we would assume, is wearing the absolute height of plate armour. This is the same period that this helmet uh, dates to. So you've seen me in harness, so it could be arms like that, and it could be through the actual plates. Now, if it's a... Um, whether it's hardened steel, or whether it's uh, lower carbon steel or perhaps even iron, the fact is that those plates are relatively thin. They're certainly thinner than a helmet or a breastplate normally is. So indeed, the arrows at close range possibly could be through the plates. However, again, here's this elephant in the room. It could just mean in the gaps. Now, on our arm harness, we've got several gaps, the principal ones being the inside of the elbow, uh, with the flex here, which might have mail or might not, and the armpit, which usually has mail although very occasionally in art it's shown without mail as well. So the problem is we don't know whether it's through plate or whether it's through mail or whether it's through somewhere which doesn't have either of those. We don't really know. All we know is that um, Henry Philongley was, according to the Paston letters, wounded three or four places by arrows in the arms. Now the important takeaway, actually, that I think from that to note is that this person, Henry, was presumably in full harness and was still wounded by arrows. How they were wounded by arrows, actually as a historian's point of view, as an arms and armor fanatic, it might be hugely interesting. But from a historian's point of view, 
it actually doesn't matter because the fact is that person would have been wearing the best harness, full plate harness of the mid 15th century that they could afford and they were still wounded by arrows. Now, Bob in his book linked below goes on to describe various other things, which I'm not going to, um, I'm not going to read the whole section out. Obviously you can go and check out the book for yourselves where he talks about um, the Battle of Sempak, the Battle of Visby, the Battle of Towton, where we're actually looking at the archaeology of skeletons, uh, in some cases armour from battles that happened, including Richard III's um, body, which was discovered in uh, 2012, which carries uh, the signs of wounds on it from the Battle of Bosworth in 1485. But the final source, because it's a written text source descriptive account um, that I'm going to uh, read out, is again going back to the Chronica de Don Pedro Nino, um, so written in the middle of the 15th century. And this relates to the Battle of Poole in 1405. And it says, it describes people being struck by arrows. It says many were already hit by these arrows and there were so many that those seemed all stuck with arrows. So sticking out of arrows like a porcupine, presumably. The standard flag and he who bore it, the standard bearer, uh, were likewise riddled with arrows. Remember if there's clouds of arrows shooting everywhere, they're not just gonna hit the people, but they're also gonna hit the, the banner, pole, the standard, everything, everything that's around. Um, just the same as in later centuries, you find standards of flags full of bullet holes. Um, uh, and the standard bearer had as many round his body as a bull in the ring. So we're thinking of uh, bullfighting here. But he was well shielded by his good armor. That's an important point. So his armor had protected him, although this was bent in several places. Well, again, we go back to the testing with that um, hilted pole hammer, pole axe, whatever you want to call it, that I did at Todd's place. And in that situation, when I struck with um, the beak at the backside of the pole axe or the hammer face, indeed, it bent the plates of the brigandine. It didn't penetrate it, it bent it. And obviously sometimes that might injure the person inside. Sometimes it just make, might make it harder to function in the armor because the armor's not working properly anymore. Sometimes it might do nothing at all. Um, so again, very interesting. It shows the flip side. It shows that arrows are being used in abundance, in, in clouds almost, uh, and they're having effect and they are wounding people some of the time, but also armor often very often does its job. And in this case, protected from those arrows. So there we go. Obviously this is a colossal subject and it's one that I will revisit many times in the future and I've visited many times in the past uh, with other source material. But this is a really good little book that I highly recommend. And um, it's got, like I say, it's got some source material in it that I hadn't seen before, I, that what I'd read out there, I hadn't seen before reading this book. So very, very interesting stuff. I recommend you go and check it out. And the subject of weapons versus armor is always an interesting one, but I have to say my experimentation has actually opened my eyes slightly to the fact that the variables are so broad that depending on which variables you choose, which weapon, um, which armor, which thickness of plate, what type of steel plate it is, whether it's hardened or not, or wrought iron, makes a huge difference to the results you get out. So I think we should ex be expecting a broad spectrum of results from the sources because it's such a broad spectrum of possibilities. Thanks for watching. I'll see you again soon on the channel. Remember to subscribe if you haven't done already and click that notification bell, please. And I will see you back here for another video really soon on Scholar Gladiatoria channel. Cheers, folks.